Coming up on Lawmakers, the Senate approves the creation of school vouchers for special needs students. U.S. Airways drops its hostile bid to take over Delta. And the first step in creating a city of Dunwoody and North DeKalb County is successful. Those stories and more are coming up next. This is Lawmakers, your source for all the news from under the Gold Dome. Here are your anchors, and Wandy Lawson and David Zelsky. Good evening. Also on tonight's program, a joint House-Senate Transportation Committee hears ideas to reduce Atlanta traffic congestion. And an update on Georgia's economic outlook, but our top story tonight, passage of school voucher legislation. A bill that provides private school vouchers for children with special needs passed the Senate today after hours of debate. Senate President Pro Tem Eric Johnson sponsors Senate Bill 10, which gives parents of special needs children the right to attend private schools. He added that No Child Left Behind is not working for these children. We don't want to move No Child Left Behind into the private schools. We want to develop an alternative way of assessing the child's progress, and that parent will be given that assessment each year. We will know who these children are, we will know where they are, and we're going to know how they're doing. To meet these qualifications, a student must be a Georgia resident, must have one or more specified disabilities, must have spent the prior school year in attendance at a public school, and had an individualized education program written by the school, must have been admitted to a participating school, and the parent must have submitted an application for a scholarship to the student's resident school system. Opponents of the bill argued two main points. First, that this program would lead to future voucher programs. The question's always been, if you don't want to take it somewhere else, then why won't you take the language that limits it? The second, that private schools chosen to participate could discriminate based on religion, gender, and disability. State and federal law regarding racial discrimination would apply. But if it comes down to religion, if it comes down to gender, and if it comes even disability, the private school can exclude in the application process, in the admission process. SB 10 ought to pass this body 56 to nothing. And I hope that you will stand for those families and, and allow just a new option. It's not enough money. It may not have transportation. But it is something new and something different and some sort of hope for these families that all they want to do is raise that child up as high as they can go with the most opportunity they can. After the bill passed the Senate, Senator Johnson held a press conference with three parents of disabled children who believe this bill could improve the lives of their kids. The Joseph Sam School has been there for quite some time. They're phenomenal with helping my son with his needs, and he has cerebral palsy, so they um, are able to take care of him. I've been there. I've toured the school. They've met my son. There's equipment there and people that know how to cater to his needs specifically. The problem is, is that I can't afford it. That I'll do whatever I have to do, but I can't pay $8,000 every year. I can't do it. The government school's approach of one size fits some works for those some. It is antithetical for the type of pedagogy that has to be applied to learning disabled students. Again, Senate Bill 10 passed by a vote of 31 to 23 and now goes to the House. The only amendment that passed was sponsored by Johnson himself. U.S. Airways has backed out of its bid for a hostile takeover of Atlanta-based Delta Airlines. The $10 billion bid fell through this morning after a committee of creditors said they would not support the merger. As the Senate recessed today, Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle responded to the news. We were very excited. Obviously, we worked very diligently to ensure that Delta was in the strongest negotiating position and very, very pleased that the creditors really realized uh, how important Delta means, not only to our state, but also uh, that this deal is not good for, for our state and our country. The state legislature passed Senate Resolution 49 earlier this session. That was a resolution encouraging the U.S. Justice Department to oppose the hostile takeover of the airline, which is an integral part of the business community here in Georgia. Well, I think that we had an opportunity to express our views, not only in the Senate, but also in the House. And we're very, very pleased that, that the creditors uh, looked at all the facts and realized that this was not a good deal. The lieutenant governor did not have a chance to talk to Delta management before our interview. He says he's encouraged that the company will have a chance to emerge from bankruptcy as an independent company. 
Residents of the Dunwoody community in North Fulton County may get a chance to vote on incorporation soon. A bill enabling that vote passed the, state, the Senate State and Local Government Operations Committee today. Lawmakers Jesse Freeman was there and has more. Jesse. Senate Bill 82 and a companion piece of legislation passed by a vote of 4 to 2 today. The vote went right down party lines. Somewhat like the fight that led to Sandy Springs Incorporation last year, this is about local control and perhaps even more importantly, $15 million of taxes, much of that generated by the Perimeter Center CID Business District. The proposed city of Dunwoody would include roughly half of the Perimeter Center Community Improvement District. That's a significant portion of the area's tax base. If the CID is not included, it drops to about $9 million. Okay. It goes up by two-thirds if Perimeter Center is included. We oppose the incorporation of, uh, uh, of areas in the county that serves as major regional retail developments in the county, and that includes Perimeter Mall uh, and surrounding retail development. Senator Dan Weber says the people of the area made their desires known in a poll conducted in October. It showed 66 percent in favor with an undecided block. There were about 20-some percent opposed to it. Some of those residents made it to the committee meeting. I think you will empower and advance uh, the communities that have the local control through their own cities. Committee member Emmanuel Jones argued that the Senate's DeKalb delegation is not behind the bill and asked why the measure was being rushed through. That was part of my campaign. And, and Dunwoody is at the north end of the county. And we're moving the legislation forward the best way we know how. Yvonne Williams is the president of the Perimeter Center CID and she advised the committee that the district was hesitant to get behind the incorporation proposal because it already has considerable growth momentum. The recently incorporated city of Sandy Springs includes another part of the CID so the president is familiar with the effects of incorporation. Reporting live, I'm Jesse Freeman for Lawmakers. Thanks, Jesse. A bill to revitalize the payday lending industry in Georgia got a hearing in the House Banks and Banking Committee today. Before House Bill 163 was referred to subcommittee, sponsor Steve Tomlin explained some of its provisions. The charge is limited to $15 per hundred. So if somebody wanted to walk out of, a, out of one of these uh, lending institutions, they'd have to write a check for, for 450 and they would take home $350. $350. If for reasons of a non-sufficient fund check comes back when this check is due, they, they give up, the people cannot exercise the Title 16, the bad check provisions, to collect it. Other than if it was fraud or they just completely misrepresent it, like closing account. And if somebody cannot pay at the end of the period, then the lender is required by this document that a payment plan can be requested. And they can, pay, they can request up to four equal installments with no, with no cost whatsoever. Under HB 163, a customer would present a valid driver's license and a check. The payday lender could then loan up to $750 or 25% of the customer's gross monthly income. A fee of $15 would be charged on every $100 borrowed, and the borrower could not roll the balances over into new loans. When Representative Tomlin was asked why the legislation was necessary, he said payday lending could fill a void in communities unserved by other financial institutions. I think loans are already being made on the Internet. Um, you know, if you go on the Internet, you'll find evidence of this. I think you'll find on border states, where our border states have it, that people are crossing state lines to go to payday lenders. Why do we need it? I think it's just, it's just another element to, I guess, to a market, I think, that is redlined to a certain extent. That it's, it's hard to get a short-term loan for two or $300 from um, a bank and financial institution. The payday lending bill was referred to the Financial and Institutional Services and to the Regulations and Oversight Subcommittees, along with three other bills that would allow consumers to freeze their credit reports. The Civil Rights Group, the Congress of Racial Equality, is speaking out in favor of HB 163 as a fair lending option. We'll hear the core perspective on tomorrow night's broadcast. Members of both the House and Senate Transportation Committees heard today from a transportation expert looking at ways to ease traffic congestion in downtown Atlanta. Lawmaker Sandra Parrish joins us live with more. Sandra. 
David, a system of express tollways, sometimes referred to as Lexus lanes, is the answer to Atlanta's congestion problem. That, according to the Reason Foundation, a national public policy think tank, which chose Atlanta as part of a three-year study on congestion in major cities. Robert Poole, director of the Foundation's Transportation Studies, told lawmakers Atlanta's congestion has grown because 77 percent of job growth in Metro Atlanta has been in its suburbs. In order to even bring a little bit of relief, he says six additional lanes are needed on the connector and two additional lanes each on the northern sections of 285, 75, and 85. So we said, wow, <laughs> that's a tall order. But we said, all right. Given what we see, innovative things that are being done in other states and other countries, is it, would it, is it conceivable that there's a way to do to add something like that capacity in those places, to or to at least solve those problems in Atlanta? And our conclusion is yes, we think there is a way to do that. We ended up proposing four major additions to the system, all of which would use uh, value pricing, a kind of variable toll. Uh, because they'd be options, they'd be new options that people otherwise wouldn't have and that they could choose to use if they wanted better uh, trips uh, for a price. One is, as I'm sure you saw in, uh, when the AR, uh, Atlanta Journal-Constitution uh, did a nice story about it, uh, is a north-south tunnel that would extend southward from where the Georgia 400 currently uh, terminates uh, and in effect fill in a missing link that was actually in some early plans for the Metro Atlanta uh, Expressway system. Uh, but done as a, as a deep bore tunnel using a tunnel boring machine similar to what's being used for the Atlanta sewer tunnel uh, to, to avoid any interference with the neighborhoods and land uses there. One intermediate uh, entrance and exit to uh, access downtown via Freedom Parkway. Otherwise, no impact on traffic in any of those neighborhoods. Secondly, a complete network. Instead of building a, a set of H, a much bigger set of HOV lanes on the freeways, instead build what we call an express toll network. Most of it would be two lanes in each direction. Some of it would have to be elevated because of, of space constraints. In fact, probably a lot of it would have to be elevated. Uh, but that's doable. Third, we proposed a new east-west uh, partly tunnel, partly tollway, partly freeway uh, uh, below I-20, basically extending Lakewood uh, in both directions uh, to provide a, an alternative to I-20 and a new access point, new way to get to the airport. And finally, a separate toll truckway system uh, for long-haul trucks to provide a major time-saving alternative for the trucks that now get stuck and it takes them an extra hour to get uh, through Atlanta. Now, Poole says the toll lanes could be built through a public-private partnership and would eventually become self-supporting. Lawmakers today seem receptive to his ideas. Reporting live, I'm Sandra Parrish for Lawmakers. The House voted today to honor former Governor Zell Miller with a statue on the Capitol grounds. H.R. 16 is a non-binding resolution that encourages the Arts Commission to place the monument. Miller has been criticized in the past by fellow Democrats for endorsing Republicans, including President Bush and Governor Perdue. But there was no debate today, only a stream of lawmakers, mostly Democrats, who remember Zell fondly. He asked me to sit down. And he reared back and he said... Benny, about this you coming to work for me, the question is not do I want you to come to work for me. The question is do you really want to come to work for me. This man has had probably as much of an impact on bringing Georgia forward and out of the pack of the southeast and in the nation of anyone I know in my lifetime. When I was at Young Harris, I never dreamed I would be in this well, in this position, urging my colleagues to erect a statue of you on these grounds. But I proudly do so today. He didn't make the book, but I introduced him to Maynard Jackson. I introduced him to Glenn Bryant. I brought him down to Liberty County the first time he ever came to Liberty County. And didn't make the book either, but some of the first money he ever had when he ran for the lieutenant governor I helped raise for him in Hinesville. Zell was so interesting. He was so far ahead of his time when he was a teenager. Let me just give you an idea. He proxied his hair. He had streaks through it. We looked at somebody like that back then, like, what's wrong with you, man? You lost your mind. 
House Resolution 16 passed 153-3. to It moves to the Senate. At a celebration last week honoring the One Millionth Hope Scholarship recipient, Zell Miller expressed gratitude and humility about the possibility of the statue. I think it would be wise to let, before you do anything like that, let the person's life be completed. And uh, I'm 75 years old next month. I haven't got far to go to complete it. In 2004, the Senate adopted a resolution to create a Zell Brian Miller Tribute Committee and place a Miller statue at the Capitol. That measure stalled in the House. The House passed several housekeeping measures today. House Bill 98 addresses House and Senate committees that have undergone name changes. Representative Barry Fleming explains. We periodically change the names of committees uh, in our rules, and the Senate does the same thing. Uh, Sewell Brumbry, our head legislative counsel, asked us to correct uh, those name changes in our code because quite often in the code section uh, that we uh, adjust regularly, uh, the committee names don't get changed. And so this is basically a cleanup bill that will go through the codes and update all the names of the committees that the House and Senate have changed over the past few years. Uh, the best example is what you see right there on the first page. Uh, the Agriculture Committee of the Senate is now called the Senate Agriculture and Consumer Affairs Committee. And the bill is full of changes just like that. House Bill 98 passed without opposition. So did House Resolution 46 to change the committee process for local legislation. In other House news, Democrats today introduced a measure allowing state funds to be used to fund the Peach Care Insurance Program if Congress fails to reauthorize the funding by March. House Bill 236 was assigned to the Insurance Committee, and two proposals to revise the HOPE Scholarship rules were introduced in the House today. House Bill 228, sponsored by Representative DeBose Porter, would remove the hourly cap on HOPE Scholarships. Representative Bill Hembree introduced House Bill 243 to remove the HOPE caps at the state's technical schools. Both HB 228 and HB 243 are in the Higher Education Committee. For those of you with access to the Internet, you can watch lawmakers online. Visit our website at gpb.org for more information. Click on Watch Online, then follow the instructions for watching live or looking at past lawmakers' programs in our archives. That website address again is gpb.org, just another way we keep you apprised of what's going on at the Georgia General Assembly. We'd like to also recommend a website that's a valuable resource for information about the Georgia General Assembly. Go to www.legis.ga.gov. That website is a great research tool that we at lawmakers use on a regular basis. The Senate Appropriations Committee heard from two economic forecasters today to help with the 2008 budget. These experts compared Georgia's economic outlook on a national scale when it comes to job growth, interest rates, risk factors, and consumer spending. Senate Appropriations Chairman Jack Hill begins. Before we get started on 08, we thought it was a good, good time to, uh, to get an update on the immediate uh, look at Georgia's economy and the national economy. So to, to do that, we couldn't think of uh, better folks to invite to discuss it than a representative of the Federal Reserve Bank here in Atlanta and uh, an economist that many of you know very well from Georgia State. Income growth is driven in large part by employment growth, and that raises the question, how has the state been doing on an employment basis? There are several ways we could look at this, and I just want to conclude my presentation here to look at employment from three perspectives. Geographically within the state, geographically relative to an important neighboring state, and then within Georgia, but across industries, to look at where, where the source of some of the job growth. There will be a bit of a slowdown in the early part of this year. The jury is still out on that one. If I turn out to be wrong on the rate cut forecast, it's because the economy is more stronger than what I thought. And, you, and we would both love it because we would get much more revenue. But in terms of going forward, in 2008 is the good part, but in 2007 is the mixture. The House must first pass their version of the budget before the Senate can take the forecaster's advice into theirs. A bill aimed at allowing certain health insurance plans to be exempted from premium taxes was heard by the Senate Insurance and Labor Committee today. Senator Judson Hill, sponsor of Senate Bill 28, says the legislation would provide for the development of consumer-driven health care. The Insuring Georgia's Families Act, Senate Bill 28, includes free market-based reforms and incentives to give people better access to health care 
at lower prices. I believe free market principles, transparency, and competition are three essential elements to making health care and health insurance more affordable. Georgians at every income level deserve to have a health care system that works. The Senate committee removed SB 28's reference to tax exemption due to the fact that all bills concerning taxes must originate in the House. No vote was taken on that measure today. The committee will consider the bill again in the future. Representatives of the Georgia Agorama Authority invited legislators to take a step back into history today. Lawmakers Candace Turnus was on hand and has the story. Have you ever wanted to take a break from life for just a moment? Georgia Agorama is a museum that prides itself on preserving Georgia's rural heritage and allows visitors to indulge in a simpler life. During a joint committee meeting, Agorama officials met with legislatures to ask for support in raising awareness about the museum. If you don't know where you have been, you don't know where you are now. And I think uh, that's really basically the statement of the mission of the Agorama. And for our young people, uh, you know, to look, to look at where we were and look where we are, uh, it creates a huge amount of pride for our state. That my grandparents and great-grandparents and those who came before me actually grew up in those kind of modest and meager uh, accommodations, that they went to school in a one-room schoolhouse, that they actually cooked their meals over an open fire. I'd heard those stories, but until you really see that, it's hard to believe that that's where we've come from. What's next for Agorama? The Development Authority will meet with the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on Agriculture tomorrow to discuss the state's financial support for Georgia's growing Living History Museum. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Candace Turner. As you heard, that was Candace Turner, not Candace Turnus, as I first said. I don't know who that is. But uh, one day after Tourism Day, the former Senate Economic Development Committee Chairman Jeff Mullis passed the official tourism hat to the new chairman, Chip Pearson. Here's an exclusive clip of the ceremony. The senator from the, from the 51st and myself were going to do the traditional passing of the tourism hat. As you know, I was the former uh, chairman of economic development, which used to be also tourism, but we know that tourism is economic development. And uh, what a great committee that was, but what a great committee that will be as well. And I, as uh, one great American once said, you haven't seen nothing yet. So I'd like to bring the uh, senator from the 51st down here and pass the traditional tourism hat of the Senate, the Rock City hat. And I know you're thinking that I'm going to wear this hat, but I'm going to pass it to my friend, the chairman of the Senate Economic Development Committee. Please give your hand to oh. Senator Pierce. Oh. The chair recognizes the distinguished senator from the 51st. Please do not wear the hat. Uh, I will wear the hat on behalf of uh, my friend and the, and the uh, previous chairman of this uh, very important committee. And I'll, I'll say that if you'd have told me three years ago I'd be standing in the well of the Georgia State Senate wearing a Rock City hat, I'd say that you and I were both crazy. So here we go. And, uh, I'm glad the TV cameras it are fits. alive. It fits. And in other capital news, members of a health alliance say they're on a mission to raise awareness about kidney disease and prevention. Today, the Georgia Renal Coalition held a press conference at the Capitol to educate legislators about the need for a comprehensive kidney care policy. Lawmakers Quandra Collins has that story. 12,000 Georgians, over 12,000 Georgians today, rely on dialysis services. And nationally, over 20 million Americans have chronic kidney disease. As is the case in many medical conditions, early detection is crucial. We definitely need to increase awareness and screening. In celebration of Georgia Dialysis Day, more than 200 kidney disease patients and caregivers traveled from around the state to ask legislatures for better Medicaid funding to pay for dialysis treatment. For some Medicaid funding. Right now, Georgia Medicaid is one of the lowest paying states in the nation. They only pay $113 for a dialysis treatment. 
which is way under what our costs are, which are about $160. In addition to today's rally, Reed Coalition members say that they are trying to promote a bill that will create a kidney disease joint task force between health care providers and legislatures, which will educate the public about disease care and prevention. Supporters say establishing a kidney care policy will not only improve kidney health in Georgia, but it will also help educate future generations about kidney disease and prevention. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Quandra Collins. With the Super Bowl less than a week away, football is on many people's minds, but it was high blood pressure, not football, that was the topic when NFL great Joe Montana visited the Capital Education Center today. Diagnosed with high blood pressure in 2002, Montana has been traveling the country, educating people about the risks of high blood pressure and how to effectively manage the condition. Stroke, blindness, and kidney disease can all be caused by high blood pressure. However, a healthy diet and regular exercise are two ways to control blood pressure and avoid these conditions. Montana said it was the diet part that was most difficult for him. You know, I think the biggest part of it is diet. When I look back on it, I mean, the exercise part was easier, but diet is always the toughest part because nobody wants to really give up the foods that they like. And now, Montana is so dedicated to this cause, he has written a book called Joe Montana's Family Playbook for Managing High Blood Pressure. My blood pressure was at the point where I, you know, we tried diet and exercise alone, but it just didn't work. And then getting on the right medication was a big part of it. And that is all. We will head to the uh, where the General Assembly honored Atlanta Falcons third string quarterback DJ Shockley. Today, Senator Valencia Say and Representative Wade Starr presented an athlete who got his start playing their districts, playing quarterback at North Clayton High School before going on to the University of Georgia. Shockley said standing before the House of Representatives was more humbling than playing before a packed stadium. Played in front of. 92,000 or play in front of, you know, 60,000 is easy, you know, that's something I hardly ever think about, but to be here, it's, a, it's an honor, it's a privilege, and it's kind of overwhelming to, you know, stand up, stand up here and be able to speak in front of you, so uh, you know, it's a privilege and an honor, and once again, thank you, have a good day. Shockley threw 24 touchdowns his senior year at Georgia. He is the first UGA player drafted by the Falcons since 1988. Well, even if you've spent a lot of time at the Capitol, you may not have seen him. And House Audiovisual Manager Bill Barr liked it that way. For 30 years, he was behind the scenes, making sure that microphones were working, screens were available for the overheads, and more recently for the PowerPoint presentations. And today, Mr. Barr bid the General Assembly farewell. I have some prepared remarks that shouldn't last longer than about 20, 25 minutes. <laughs> That's pretty good, Bill. <laughs> Over the years, I've written too many good speeches to ruin my reputation by giving one now. So I just want to say that I am grateful and deeply, deeply honored. Thank you. And in retirement, Mr. Barr will have more time to enjoy bird watching, writing poetry, and Irish dancing. He also plans to open an independent media company. Well, coming up tomorrow on Lawmakers, the first legislation resulting from recommendations of the GeorgiaSpeaks.com initiative is heard in committee. We'll have that story and all the latest from Under the Gold Dome. That's tomorrow night at 7. If you've missed any part of this Lawmakers broadcast, be sure to tune in tomorrow morning at 5.30 a.m. when Lawmakers repeats. Now stay tuned for Georgia Outdoors. Tonight's episode is about the crime-fighting efforts of the Department of Natural Resources. Georgia Outdoors DNR CSI is coming up next here on GPV. And that is our broadcast. Broadcast for this, the 12th legislative day of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm David Zelsky. And I'm Wandy Lawson. Thanks for ha being here. Have a good evening. This has been a production of Georgia Public Broadcasting.